It came on July 27, 1953. While the communists signed at Panmunjom, General Clark, in ceremonies at the UN base camp in Munsan, signed six copies of the document which would end the bloodshed. There was excitement, but little rejoicing. Welcome to The Internet Says It's True, a show where we learn something new every week, part of the WCBE podcast experience. My name is Michael Kent, and I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. I appreciate you listening, and I'm happy you're here. That's what I'm thankful for. Now, today's topic comes to us from my good friend, Mark. Hey, Mike, it's Mark. Remember the time when we were in Korea, and they told us about an axe murder that happened at the DMZ? That'd make a pretty cool episode. I'd love to learn more. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I do remember it. That was 11 years ago now. We went to the DMZ, and I still tell people about that. It's a really interesting story that nobody knows about, and that's why it is perfect for the Internet Says It's True. On the last day of a nearly month-long tour performing for the troops in Korea, we toured the joint security area of the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. This is a closely watched area of the DMZ where it's common to see North Korean and South Korean troops standing at attention just steps away from each other. I always describe the tour there as a really strange combination of active war zone and tourism. Razor wire fences and tour buses, machine guns and photo opportunities. The war in Korea was never won or lost or declared over. It's just on a 68 year ceasefire. And every once in a while, tensions between the two countries flare, like in 2017 when North Korea fired on a defector as he escaped the country. Heroin escaped from North Korea, a young soldier risking his life, driving across the no man's land of the DMZ, crashing his Jeep and making a run for it. You can see him there just yards from the border as his fellow soldiers were firing on him. By the way, the area where that happened is exactly where I stood seven years before. The Joint Security Area, sometimes referred to as Truce Village, or more correctly, Panmun Jam, is a large area in the middle of the DMZ where UN security officers led us on a tour of the region. Before that tour, we had to have a briefing telling us what we could and couldn't do. And in that briefing room, encased in glass, is a tree trunk. A small brass plaque in Korean and English is attached to the top of the trunk. It reads... This is a piece of the tree over which two UNC officers were murdered by North Korean guards, 18 August, 1976. It was that poplar tree that began the entire incident in 1976. Throughout the DMZ, there are a series of observation posts and checkpoints. You can see these buildings throughout the joint security area, and the two buildings that we'll be talking about today are two that are near a small bridge. The bridge has a significant history. It was used for prisoner exchanges at the end of the Korean War, and it's known as the Bridge of No Return. Near that bridge is a road in a United Nations checkpoint called CP Number 3. Not far away from that was Observation Post Number 5, and during the winter months, there was a clear view of CP Number 3 from the Observation Post. But by summer, when the leaves were full on the trees, you could only see the very top of the checkpoint building. In particular, there was one poplar tree that had grown up to be 40 feet tall and was obstructing the view. Now, at this point, it's probably important to provide a small backstory. I said the incident started with this tree, but there's a little bit more than that. In 1976, it had been more than 20 years since the armistice at the end of the Korean War, but tensions were still high. A couple months prior to the tree incident, a North Korean soldier got into a fight with an American officer and Captain Arthur Boniface, who had just arrived at Camp Liberty Bell, that's the camp on the American side of the joint security area, had to break the fight up. After that, a group of American soldiers had been held at gunpoint by North Korean soldiers and once again, Captain Boniface had to step in and settle the matter. So by the time Captain Boniface showed up to supervise a group of people to trim the poplar tree, there was already some bad blood from recent events. They had been requesting for the tree to be trimmed, and their requests were denied by the North Koreans. On August 18th of 1976, Captain Boniface and his South Korean Army counterpart, Captain Kim, arrived with 11 American enlisted men, their platoon leader, 
First Lieutenant Mark Barrett, and a group of five Korean Service Corps personnel. They showed up in a truck with axes and picks to trim the tree and began to get to work. Before they could complete the trimming, a truck rushed in full of 15 North Korean guards. Their lieutenant, Pak Chul, demanded that they stop trimming the tree. He yelled to Boniface, quote, The branches that are cut will be of no use, just as you will be after you die. Boniface had been trained to ignore threats from the North Korean guards, who were always looking for reasons to say the Americans were the aggressors. So he continued to oversee the trimming of the tree while Lieutenant Pack sent for 30 more soldiers. So as Captain Boniface turned his back to the North Koreans, Lieutenant Pack removed his watch, wrapped it in a cloth, and put it in his pocket. Another North Korean officer began rolling up his sleeves. They were preparing to fight, but nobody saw that it was about to happen. We'll continue this story after a quick break from some of the people who helped make this show possible. In 2019, a world champion debater went head-to-head with a computer program designed by IBM. A debate topic was announced, and each side had just 15 minutes to prepare. In testing, the computer program had proven it could persuade people to actually change their minds about all sorts of issues. But could this artificial intelligence system come up with compelling arguments that would persuade more people than an accomplished human debater could? To find out, check out episode 50 of my podcast, Opinion Science. I'm Andy Luttrell, and I'm a social psychologist who studies people's opinions and when they change. On Opinion Science, I talk to social scientists and professional communicators to get to the bottom of how we form opinions, how we express them, and how we can be convinced to change them. So go to opinionsciencepodcast.com and subscribe to Opinion Science for new episodes every other week. I think you'll like it, but that's just my opinion. If you watched Innovation Nation last weekend with Mo Rocca, you saw Scotty Vest, awesome functional clothing. They were featured nationwide on CBS. It's been colder lately, and if you look at the photos on my Instagram, you'll see I'm wearing one of my favorite clothing items for this time of year, my Scotty Vest fleece. It's been awesome for traveling around because it's got pockets for all my gadgets, my phone, my glasses, my wallet, charging cord, you name it. I'm confident they've got an article of clothing that you'll love. The best thing you can do is take a look at all the awesome pocket-packed clothing on their website. Give them a look at scottyvest.com, and just by listening to this show, you get 15% off your order. Enter promo code TM15. Now that's a new promo code. That's scottyvest.com, promo code TM15, or use the link in the show notes. You've got a lot of things to fret over lately. When you're traveling, safety is a concern. Your own safety and your friends and your families. That's the most obvious concern. With this app called Beacon, you have full control of how much you'd like to share with whom, when, and for how long. So once a year, my friends from college and I get together for a guy's weekend. We come from all over the place, and that day that we're meeting up, we're constantly texting each other to update our ETAs so we can figure out dinner, and it gets to be a lot of texts. With Beacon... Everyone signs up and then there's no more need for all those text messages. You can instantly see the ETAs of everyone. And the best part is that Beacon cares about protecting your privacy. So you control how much info you give and when. When you don't want the app to show your location or your name, you just toggle that off. It's that easy. Check out Beacon on Google Play or the App Store or go to beacon.site. Let's get back to the story. North Korean Lieutenant Pak Chul was known as Lieutenant Bulldog because of his history of starting fights and being difficult to work with. As the 40-foot poplar tree was being trimmed, he yelled, kill the bastards, and began running toward the Americans and South Koreans. His soldiers picked up the tools being used to trim the tree and started attacking. Their first targets were the leaders of the group, thinking they could stop them from ordering a counterattack. At least five Korean guards attacked Captain Boniface with an axe and various tools, beating him to death on the ground. Another group attacked Lieutenant Mark Barrett, who was attacked, then jumped over a wall to escape and fell 15 feet. The entire attack only lasted about 30 seconds. Almost every person sent to trim the poplar tree sustained injuries. They placed the body of Captain Boniface in the back of the truck and retreated to safety, but couldn't find Barrett. It turns out the North Koreans had been taking turns going down into the depression where Barrett was lying and hitting him with an axe. By the time he was recovered, 
it was too late. He died on the way to the hospital. I'm telling you the story the way it really happened, but here's how it was reported that day in North Korean media. Quote, Around 10.45 a.m. today, the American imperialist aggressors sent in 14 hoodlums with axes into the joint security area to cut the trees on their own accord, although such a work should have mutually consented beforehand. Four persons from our side went to the spot to warn them not to continue the work without our consent. Against our persuasion, they attacked our guards in mass and committed a serious provocative act of beating our men, wielding murderous weapons and depending on the fact that they outnumbered us. Our guards could not but resort to self-defense measures under the circumstances of this reckless provocation." End quote. The action that followed is the true topic of this episode. It was called the most expensive tree trimming operation in history, and it's one of the truly untold great moments of Gerald Ford's presidency. If you consider the political situation of the time, Ronald Reagan had just challenged Gerald Ford for the Republican nomination for president, and one of the things that he was really hitting Ford with was the idea that he was weak on communism. Ford had pardoned draft dodgers from the Vietnam War, and he needed to look tough on foreign communist powers. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger went to China to make sure they'd put their foot down on North Korea if needed. He said, quote, We cannot permit the principle to be established that Americans can be assaulted with impunity. They also met with the President of South Korea to make a statement. Jointly, they decided to go back and trim the poplar tree, but to do it in a huge way that would show North Korea the force of the combined military strength they were dealing with. If Kim Il-sung wanted to send a message, the United Nations Command with the power of the United States military would send an even stronger one. It was called Operation Paul Bunyan, and it was scheduled to happen just three days after Captain Boniface and Lieutenant Barrett were killed. It's amazing the amount of force that was scrambled in just three days. The tree trimming would be conducted with a convoy of 23 trucks and military road vehicles supplied by both the South Korean and American armies. Two 30-man platoons provided backup to these forces with guns and clubs. The bridge was rigged with explosives in case the North Koreans started driving trucks in their direction. Circling overhead in the air were 20 utility helicopters, six Cobra attack helicopters, several nuclear-capable B-52 bombers sent from Guam, escorted by American F-4 Phantom fighter jets, a dozen C-130 gunships, and South Korean F-5 and F-86 fighters. The aircraft carrier USS Midway had been moved to a defensive position just offshore of the DMZ. Just outside the DMZ on land, military battalions prepared Hawk missiles aimed at North Korea. Thousands of troops prepared at their bases throughout South Korea, just in case this led to war. Camp Liberty Bell was rigged with explosives in case North Korea attacked and took over the base. It was the most expensive tree trimming in the history of the world. Operation Paul Bunyan was a success if the objective was trimming a tree. The entire tree was chopped down. It was also a success if the objective was getting North Korea to apologize. After seeing the military might displayed to trim the tree during the operation, North Korean leader Kim Il-sung expressed his regret at the axe murder incident later that same day. When my friend Mark and I visited the joint security area, we did so because my show that night was at the American military base on the south side of the JSA. It was a great show, an amazing experience. And I should mention that the base was renamed. When we visited, it wasn't called Camp Liberty Bell anymore. It's now known by a new name, Camp Boniface. Well, now it's time for the part of the podcast where normally I call a friend, but just like we did last year when I recorded over the Thanksgiving holiday, I'm going to skip calling a friend. But today, we're going to still play the quiz game. I'm just going to play with you, the listener. So you're my special guest today, and I'm happy you're listening and subscribing to the podcast. So what do you say? Let's play the quiz game. Here is your first question. And for the first question, we're playing for a joke. So if you get it wrong, you have to tell me a joke. You can do that on your favorite social media platform. My Twitter and my Instagram are both at Michael Kent, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-K-E-N-T. Or if you want to follow the show accounts, it's at The Net Says True 
Uh, so like I said, if you get it wrong, you have to tell me a joke. Here's your question. During what time frame did the Korean War take place? Was it A, 1949 to 1955, B, 1950 to 1953, or C, 1952 to 1956? A was 49 to 55, B was 50 to 53, or C, 52 to 56. The answer is B, 1950 to 1953. Congratulations if you got it right. If you missed that, send me a joke on Twitter. Again, it's at Michael Kent. Question two. For this question, we're playing for five push-ups. So if you get it wrong, you have to do five push-ups. I kind of like this idea of playing the game without someone here because I don't have to do anything. It's all on you. Here's your question. Approximately how many United States troops are currently stationed in South Korea? Is it A, 10,000, B, 200,000, or C, 30,000? So that was A, 10,000, B, 200,000, or C, 30,000? The answer is C, 30,000 troops. Now, as for Korea, the South Korean military is around half a million, whereas the North Korean army claims a total of 1.28 million troops. So if you guessed A or B, drop and give me five push-ups. All right, let's keep playing. Here's question three, and for this question, we're playing for a coveted The Internet Says It's True sticker. These are very hard to come by and extremely valuable. If you get this one right, let me know via Facebook or Twitter or the website, however, and I will send you one in the mail, I promise. Here's the question. The DMZ extends all the way across the Korean Peninsula following the 38th parallel. On the east, it extends all the way to the Sea of Japan. To which body of water does it extend to the west? Is it A, the Yellow Sea, B, the Sea of China, or C, the Andaman Sea? So that was A, the Yellow Sea, B, the Sea of China, or C, the Andaman Sea. Well, the answer is C, but the Yellow Sea. So the answer is A, the Yellow Sea. If you got that right, send me a message and I will send you a sticker in the mail. How are you doing so far? We've done three questions. Some of you might be three for three. Some of you might have missed one. Let me know. Here's question four. We'll keep on moving. For question four, we are playing for a mention to a friend. So if you get it wrong, you've got to tell a friend about the Internet says it's true. But here's the catch. If you get this question right, you have to tell a friend about the Internet says it's true. So you're helping out either way. Here's your question. Is the DMZ closer to Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, or Seoul, the capital of South Korea? It is definitely closer to one than the other. Which one is it? The answer is Seoul, South Korea. The DMZ is only 37 miles from Seoul. It's actually 130 miles from Pyongyang. So if you guessed Seoul, South Korea, uh, you've got to tell someone about this show. However, if you guessed Pyongyang, You've got to tell someone about this show. Hopefully you're doing well. It's time for question five. Normally for question five, I do sort of a feel-good open-ended question for our guests. But for our final question, today we're going to play double or nothing on the other questions. So if you missed this last one, you've got to send me another joke, do five more push-ups, and tell another someone about the show. Here is your question. Which one of these is a true fact about North Korea. One of these is true. This isn't a trick question where they're all true. Only one of these is true. A. North Koreans must wear one of 28 approved haircuts. B. North Koreans must wear a specific set of sacred underwear in order to enter the temple. Or C. North Koreans are allowed to eat steak once a year and must write a letter of thanks to the dear leader for the meat. So it's either 28 approved haircuts, sacred underwear, or steak once a year and they have to write a thank you letter for it. 
Well, the answer is A. North Koreans must wear one of 28 approved haircuts. Unmarried women are required to have short hair. And get this, men's hair has to be between two and two and three quarter inches long. The sad fact is that all three of these answers sound plausible. But you may have noticed B, the sacred underwear. That's true of Mormons, not North Koreans. So hopefully you got that right. If not, I can't wait to hear about your joke on Twitter or Facebook. Just email it to the show through the website if you want. It's the internet says it's true.com. How'd you do? For those of you who got all five questions right, this is for you. You did it! Congratulations! Well, that is all for this week. Thank you so much to Mark for the topic and to you for listening and for playing the quick quiz. Here's the voice of a small Korean boy. Thank you for listening to The Internet Says It's True. Don't forget to join up on Patreon if you want to see the unedited video of the guest appearance or to hear bonus episodes. You can do that at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. Also, if you learned something that you didn't already know from the show, please visit iTunes and leave us a review with five stars and a few words. That's the rule. You gotta do it. That helps us a ton because that's how the algorithm works to get the podcast suggested to more people. And that way we can keep learning something new if the internet says it's true. The Internet Says It's True would like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions helped to make this show possible. Sean Brown, Catherine Morgan, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Matt McVeigh, Jim Martin, Joanne Martin, Joshua Indress, and the show's official Emperor Kick Track. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge, and additional music this week was from Unicorn Heads, MK2, and Kevin McLeod. All audio clips in this episode are used for education and commentary and used under Fair Use Title 17 USC Section 107. You can listen to past episodes by searching for The Internet Says It's True wherever you get your podcasts, and you can see bonus content at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. 